Hello everybody, my name is Phil Rowley and this is my oldest boy Brandon. I want you to join me at my fly tying bench and I'm going to show you how to tie some of my favorite river and stream patterns. A gold bead pheasant tail deserves a place in every fly fisher's fly box, be it river, lake or stream. Here's my version of a hot spot gold bead pheasant tail that has proven its worth year after year. Here are the materials you'll need to tie this great little fly. I'm now going to tie you one of my favorite nymphs, the hot spot pheasant tail. This fly works excellent in rivers and streams, as probably most of you know. It's also an excellent pattern to use in lakes. It imitates calabatus nymphs, and in the fall season, believe it or not, it does a fantastic job mimicking young, small, what we nickname pin fry on our lakes. The flashback nature of this fly uh, really flickers just like the belly of a small little minnow. And I tie this one either on straight shank, two extra long nymph hooks such as this S82 3906B. I also like to tie it on curved scud hooks such as the C49S, particularly in rivers and streams when that humped curved posture of a hook such as the C49S does an excellent job imitating a drifting nymph. That's the posture they drift, drift with rather. So you can tie these uh, flies on either style hook and I would recommend a selection of both. So we're going to start our tying thread and we're using hot orange UTC 70 denier tying thread. Nice flat wraps. Get this in place and tie that to about the midpoint. I've got a 1 8 gold bead on this fly. You could use copper as well. And I'm going to build up a little underbody. Now depending on how you like to tie your flies or what situation it's going to be used in, you could use lead wire and tie it on here, but I'm going to show you an alternative. Perhaps you're okay with just a bead head on this fly and you want to add extra weight onto your leader when you're nymphing on a river or you want to use this in a still water environment where you don't want too much weight because we don't move this fly all that fast through the water column and we don't want our fly hanging up on the bottom. So I'm going to use for the underbody on this to complement the thread color some uni stretch on a spool in hot orange. This uh, is great material. The white is an excellent coronamid gill material. Comes in lots of different colors and it's excellent for building up nice neat tapered underbodies. Because the reason we want to build up the tapered underbody is to help with our legs. Believe it or not, if you have a lot of space between your hook and the hole in the bead, the bead tends to suck in materials, particularly your legs, and it makes it very hard to get them positioned correctly. So I'm just going to go back and forth this lays nice and flat, so just like any tying thread, you can just spin the bobbin, take out any twist that your winding motion does, and I just kind of go back and forth a little bit, a couple of times, up to the rear of the bead, pack it in there nice and tight, and then come right back down to the tying thread and tie off. It's a neat way to build up an underbody. You can even do this with coronamid patterns. A good friend of mine, John Kent, taught me this trick. He does it all the time. And it's just an excellent way to do this. But it's important to have the tying thread on first because this adds as a bit of a stopper or a wedge to stop that underbody from perhaps sliding backwards uh, if it's getting mauled and attacked by predatory trout, which is something we all hope for. So we've got that in place and now it's time to build our pheasant tail. So as the name would suggest, we've got pheasant tail in this fly. So we're going to tie in a section of uh, pheasant tail that's going to form our tail on our body. And we're just going to take 8 to 10 strands, depending on how much of a tail you want. And we're just going to hold this up. And what I'm doing, I'm going to isolate a section here. If I hold it perpendicular to the shank like this and trim it, it the net result is it evens up. i pull these into the camera here. You can see how those tips are all nice and even. So we're just going to take our scissors and trim out that section. I prefer to trim it from the stem because if you do the strip action, if you're not careful, you can accidentally pull too hard and all that effort you spent getting your tails nice and even will be for naught because they'll misalign. So we're just going to get those tied in place, hold them on, a couple of wraps, make sure we're happy. If we're not happy with the tail, if it's too long, we can always just pull on it slightly, gently, and tuck it into place. But I'm okay with that tail, about half to three quarters of the shank. And then we're just going to secure that forward a little ways and then stop. We're not going to trim off the waist at this point. 
And then we're going to take some fine copper wire that's going to be used for our ribbing material. And we're going to secure that in place. Wind it back. And then we're going to fold our pheasant tail material in place and secure it in. And this is going to be wound forward to form the body. So we're going to go up about three quarters of the shank and let our thread hang. Now we want to make sure these are durable. So one of the ways to add durability is a little adhesive. In this case we're just going to take some brushable super glue and we're just going to put a thin coating right on and then we're going to take our pheasant tail and I'm going to counterwind it. So go across underneath and come back over and this will create a crisscross pattern with the with the ribbing material. So we do this because we when we wrap our rib in traditional manner and tighten it, the tightening motions will further tighten the rib. Whereas if we counterwind often that can knock the ribbing out of position. So we're just going to have a couple of thread wraps here. Bind that in place. It's tied off. And trim away our excess and that, that pheasant tail is on there. When that glue sets, and it probably is already set by now, that's locked in there. So it also helps if the pheasant tail slips from your fingers a bit. It tends not to, un tends not to unravel too much and you can still get it back into control. So we're just going to take our fine copper wire and just wrap it forward. And because the pheasant tail went one direction and the wire ribbing went another, we have a nice crisscross pattern and that in combination with the under the super glue you use to glue the body down makes for one durable fly. And we've got that tied off and now we're just going to twist and break away the excess. Now we're going to take our tying thread right up behind the bead. If our underbody isn't quite right yet we can add a few more wraps and that's pretty good. Now the challenge, so far this looks like any other pheasant tail but I tend to tie mine a little differently. Oh, we got one short strand there so that irritates me, so it's gone. So we've got our tail in place. I put the tying thread up behind the bead, and now I'm going to tie in my flashback material that's going to cover the wing case. And for this, I'm going to use some of the Mirage Opal Tinsel in medium for this number 10. Smaller flies, obviously, you'd use small. So uh, but you don't want it uh, too wide. You want it just to um, augment the, uh, the wing case and give it a little bit of an attractive flash. I've cut off a small length from the spool. Gonna lay that on top of the hook shank flat. Tie that in place behind the bead. And then secure it back flat on top. You see how I'm lifting it on a slight angle? Make sure it stays right on top. And I'm going to wind back onto the body slightly. This way when we form the body, sorry, form the thorax and tie in the wing case, the body's just going to naturally telescope right inside of the thorax. I'm going to bring the tying thread forward again and now we're going to tie in our wing case and leg material. Now a lot of times tires use one slip of material for their wing case and legs on their pheasant tail and that's what I'm going to do here. I prepared a clump of about 10 to 12 fibers but most times people tie in the wing case and then kind of estimate how long they'll need in legs and uh, that's not always a consistent way but how I like to do it, a method I saw other tires do, is to factor in how long I want my legs to stick, stick back, so about half to three quarters, and I'm going to tie those in first. So my leg measurement is already bang on. My legs are going to be consistent, providing I, every time I tie a pheasant tail I do this step, my legs are always going to be perfect. And now I'm just going to secure the pheasant tail back, right back to where I secured the mylar. And now we're going to take a couple strands, two to three strands of peacock curl, for the thorax, kind of the signature of the North American pheasant tail popularized by the late Al Troth. And we're just going to nip off the very tips, tie in a couple of strands here, right back up behind the rear of the legs, and just wind those two strands together all the way up to the bead. Tie off once over top. Kind of weave it around, try not to mat any of the legs down. See they're already starting to tuck in behind. 
trim those off and I'm going to rotate the fly slightly because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the legs and I'm going to kind of part them on either side, see if you can see that there, but they are kind of in half, so you can get that mylar to tuck back out of the way, it really wants to get into the game early and I'm just going to rotate, my thread is right back behind the bead and I'm going to secure the far set of legs down one side of the thorax, come back up directly behind the bead again, gather the near side legs, and secure those in place. You can wrap back on the thorax. We're going to create a hot spot here, so don't worry if you have a little uh, thread showing. I got one errant leg, errant, errant rather, errant leg, one leg that won't play, let's call it that, and now I have a nice divided set of legs and you can see by tying them in in that manner they're always going to be the same length on every fly. And Now we're just going to pull over our wing case material, tie it off directly behind the bead, trim as close to the bead as we can, and then pull over our wing case material, our flashback if you will, one wrap, two wraps, and then I like to fold it back and then trim away the excess. And now we're just going to spin our tying thread and then build up a nice little fluorescent hot spot right behind the bead. You can tie these with a lime green hot spot, you can tie them with this hot orange, you can tie them with a hot pink. And of course, you could tie them traditionally with no hot spot whatsoever. Get that in place. Three turn whip finish will be fine because we're going to put a little coating on this fly. So we've got the fly tying portion complete. Now all we're going to do is add a little protection to that wing case and tie off area. And to do that, we're going to use one of the many UV resins out there. And this is Loon's UV Clear Fly Finish in the original formula. It's uh, quite thick and uh, has a nice thick viscosity that's great for coating wing cases. I'm just going to take a little bit, place a drop onto the dubbing needle, and drop that right on. Be careful not to mat down your legs and just allow that to distribute all the way along the wing case. The beauty of this, it'll just settle in there. I can put my dubbing needle down, I can close the lid on my knot on my uh, fly finish rather, knot sense also works very well and then at some point when I'm happy with the consistency I can just take my UV light and activate a little straggler in there hasn't set, so pull that out and make sure that's good and good and hard, you gotta Resist the urge to touch it. So there you have it, the finished hot spot pheasant tail. Hopefully I've showed you a unique way to tie in the legs so they're consistent on every fly you tie. This is a great pattern for lakes imitating calabatus or small bait fish, believe it or not. It also works very well when fish are focused on zooplankton. Rivers and streams, it's a great mayfly nymph, obviously, and just a great buggy looking fly that fish seldom refuse. I hope you enjoyed this. Hope you can add this to your fly box as well. For more information on fly fishing, and in particular still water fly fishing, don't forget to visit my website at flycraftangling.com. And of course, if you want to stay socially connected with me, I welcome you. Come on and join me on Facebook or join in my conversations on Twitter. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on a future episode.